welcome to De La Guatarda, Party Line Talk Show. I'm your host, Luent Stacy, and today we have a two-parter. We're going to speak with um, Frank uh, McCumber in the second half, Chief uh, Frank McCumber. But joining me right now in studio is the Grand Chief Joe Norton. Welcome to the show. Welcome. How are you? Good. Good. No, I uh, shouldn't say that. <laughs> no, you just, <laughs> not so good. You could tell me that. That's yeah. okay. <laughs> I, I guess um, um, there were, we've been given a little bit of a detail in terms of discussion. And I guess the first thing uh, is to talk about the notice of for the World Trade Center first responder. So, Yeah, um, this is something that we just found out about. Uh, and that is there's uh, an extension. Of, I guess it's a permanent, uh, uh, the victim compensation fund has been permanently extended and fully funded. In other words, people who uh, who were at the World Trade Center, you know, after the collapse and uh, participated in recovery and, you know, in, in uh, removal of rubble and all that sort of stuff, uh, <clears throat> they're... I'm pretty sure much most people know that they're eligible for uh, you know after of course seeing a doctor what have you if they have anything wrong then they're they're eligible for um, for compensation what that is how much that is I don't really know okay. that's all I know at this point in time and the announcement is uh, it's just a short uh, sh- just a short uh, announcement. Okay. As long as we got the information out, and I know there were a lot of um, iron workers who uh, yeah. who were uh, who were there right from the beginning and did help out, and I know many of them only got sick years later, so yeah. it wasn't something that was right away. So if if they can benefit from the service, you know, why not? Mm-hmm. You know. All right. The next uh, topic on here is what were your thoughts in terms of the article that was in the Gazette. Uh, regarding uh, the apology by the Quebec Premier Francois Legault um, to um, the children and and women uh, within the province and First Nations people, and I guess the second part to this is that his uh, apology was in French only, and I know that kind of got quite a few people really upset. So, just what your thoughts are? Well. Um on, upon reflection regarding that, uh, I did send a letter to to the editor regarding that, which appeared today. I don't know if I didn't get pe- to see it. People no. saw it, and and basically what it was is uh, kind of a a rebuke to say that you know you're talking about reconciliation, you're talking about all these grand things and apologizing, uh, and uh, knowing that the the diversity of the provinces that. Um, a lot of the communities are Anglophone more than they are Francophone. Anglophone plus their own language. Absolutely. And that there should have been something that should have been said in English regarding that factor. Now, if it's an oversight, or whether it was just sort of meant to be that way, I, I felt it was important to to send a, a letter to the editor. And uh, in any the last paragraph, I guess, says, says it all. It says, perhaps an, an apology... For his apology is in order. In other words, you know, you apologize, and maybe you should apologize again for not doing it in uh, in uh, in English, so that people uh, would have gotten some sense of uh, what he was talking about. I think one of the things that struck a chord for me was that it must be something new, an apology, an apology. But unless there's policies and uh, different kinds of things that are backing it up, it, in my mind, it really means nothing. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know. Yeah, regardless of whether it's in French or English. It doesn't matter, you Quebec know. Quebec is not uh, known for apologizing no. for anything. Well, no. that too. <laughs> <laughs> you got to look at it from that See, point do you think view. that's why he, he did it in French? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Because I know I had read the original article and, you know, many of the people in the province, uh, including Native Native Women's Shelter, they spoke to different, you know, First Nations communities. And and it's pretty sad, you know, some of the things that women and children, the abuse, the discrimination that people continue to go through today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, and whether or not there's going to be any changes, you know, because you're talking to... uh, if you're talking about strictly policing and the SQ, they're a hardcore, yeah. you know, group, and they just don't, they don't want to change. No. Nope. That's it, that's all, and no matter what kind of training you send them to, uh, they, um, 
they refuse, you know, to to change their ways because they grew up in the in in in, in their families and and uh, the institutions teach them that. You yeah, know? yeah. So that's that's just the way life is. Uh, it doesn't mean we have to accept it. So, you know, we have our own ways of uh, having to deal with that at some point in time. And if ever, uh, if ever uh, the premier has the courage to come and meet, meet with us, you know, then we might be able to have a discussion. Yeah, that would be nice yeah. on his part to follow up his <laughs> apology. Just saying. <laughs> Any other items that are on on your plate? We have uh, a few more minutes uh, to talk about. Well, whatever you feel. Like I guess one about. of the things. Let's talk about um, uh, the tobacco law, and I guess cannabis. You know, where mm-hmm. are those things at with regards to the community? Well, the the uh, the most recent information I don't have on tobacco law. I know there has been at least one meeting recently, if not two, regarding that uh, particular subject. Um, and Frank would have, would know more about okay. that. So I'll, I'll get him yeah. in the second half. Yeah, you, you know, <laughs> yeah. squeeze him a little bit yeah. and get it. Oh, I will. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in terms of cannabis and, and the regulations and laws, where, where is that at? Well, the, uh, in, uh, there's two parts here. One is the finalization, I guess, of the regulations, uh, by the, um, cannabis, uh, com- cannabis commission, um, and um, the meetings that they've been having, as a matter of fact, they met yesterday uh, to finalize that by the board members that have been installed. Uh, and they're, from what I understand, they're working very diligently uh, to get it off the ground as quickly as possible so people then can say, all right, this is what we have to deal with. This is how we have to deal with it. You know? and, uh, and then the... Um, the actual mechanics, the operation of it, can begin as soon as possible, and that's what everybody's pushing for, you know. But um, there are there are there are new people, so they have to have an orientation right. period, a time in which they get to understand uh, what's involved in this, and uh, then the other part is the uh, the amount of pressure that's being brought to bear by community members who want, you know. To establish a business side of this too, right? So, but what happens to the people that don't want the business side, and the people who have said this community is zero tolerance? Yet the last few weeks in the media and and people are you know small community very knowledgeable regarding drugs, alcohol, mm-hmm. uh, cannabis, you know, and and that part of it because that doesn't go away even with legislation, even yeah. with uh, you know uh, profiting uh, from some of these um, things. Well, there still has to be a discussion on that within the community. That's not over. Okay. Okay. So it's not a foregone conclusion, you know, that there's going to be, you know, a massive business side of it and all kinds of businesses thriving from it. There still has to be a discussion that has to take place. Because I think it's important because it, it, it seems to be, and people have concerns, you know, years back there was a, a, a community meeting people talked about zero tolerance yet things don't seem to be zero tolerance and it goes right to the alcohol when you look at the abc board and permits and then we're looking at the tobacco industry and you know the health concerns and the social impacts and i am not sure sometimes that that part gets partnered with you know the business industry or should to me it should be well when you say zero tolerance i understand what that meant what that means and what it meant because I was I was there when it all began and signed off on the resolution but back then there was no such thing as what we have now yeah and I'm not promoting or pushing it but at the same time though we have to realize that you know all around us it's there now it's it's legit I mean there's a dispensary in Shattagee as far as I know uh, and people can go there and buy their product and go down river and to uh at uh, 1030, I think it's called, in Brossard, and you mm-hmm. can buy it there. You can go across the river. So does that mean people that go there and buy it legitimately, according to Canadian law, Quebec law, can't come back here and smoke it? You know, that's, or, or participate in the in, in that in that particular side of it. Uh, and what do we do? Do we arrest them? Do we? But I guess that's you know, the question, and I, and I know you and I can go back to both of this uh, with the alcohol uh, yep. ABC board, and we go back that far. And I guess one of the things was to put laws in place to 
control it and that there were consequences, you know, for certain things. And then you have uh, the key peacekeepers with the UIs and all of those things. I guess the question here, will those kinds of things be put in place as well to support that part of it? From, uh, from all discussions, I mean, we still, we still have this part about talking to the community about, you know, the understanding about what happens uh, with, uh, with with people who uh, want to smoke cannabis or want to use cannabis. Mm-hmm. I'll say want to use cannabis, use. Yeah. okay, rather than smoking, you know. Right. There's the, the usage of it. Um, there, there has to be a coming to grips with the reality of what the circumstances are now. Yeah. It was the same thing with alcohol. Yeah. And, uh, you, to me, it's, way back when, and yeah. they said, "No, no, no, we can't have it. In, we can't legitimize it in the community. We can't do this. We, we can't have it sold, you know, uh, out of outlets, grocery stores, or what have you, or in restaurants. Although, you know, at the at the social clubs, the golf courses, it was already being uh, it was already being sold, and that goes back a long time. Many, I know. Years That's ago. why I know. That's so why I'm it, asking. It was breaking new ground, yeah. really." Uh, for the individual business side yeah. of, uh, of, uh, of something like alcohol. So I see us going through the same thing now. Okay. Yeah, zero tolerance, but how long does that last? Yeah. And because, you know, we didn't change the law out there. We didn't cause that to happen. We certainly can do certain things, though, internally. Yeah. Uh, if not to make it more difficult, but at the very least to make... Uh, to make people aware, awareness programs, and we've already started that, working with the various um, um, sectors of the community that have a say. That already began, you know, a year and a half to two years ago, building up to where we are now. The passage of what is uh, um, what is what is in place at this point in time. Now we go to the next step, and uh, further consultation, you know, with law enforcement with the social side of things, the hospital, and all the various areas that, that, had a, that had a say previously. We now have to go back. We have to bring the same people back to the table and start talking about, you know, what about this side now? Yeah. Know? And then also the communications and discussions in the community. Yeah, because I think the other piece to this too is how is it going to be handled for the illegal parts of it? Yeah. You know, and, and I guess that's the concern that people, you know, you keep reading, uh, people keep commenting on, people keep saying, what's going to happen there? Because we have to take that into consideration too. Regardless of what we decide, there's still going to be that part. There's still going to be people out there that'll be selling and illegally, you know, and growing it. And, uh, yeah. In, in, in uh, certain instances, I mean, we have sister communities, kind of Sadaga and Tainanega, are, they've gone full blast on that. You yeah. Know? So what do we do? Yeah. Uh, if our people can go there, they can purchase, get whatever they, they want, from what I understand. Uh, and some, from what I understand, are actually doing that now, yeah. as we speak. And I also think when you monitor also the outside uh, and how this law came into being with nothing. Now all of a sudden they're backpedaling in some areas because it's kind of this free game thing's not really working out, you know. And now they're going to try and put legislation, whether it works or not. I'm not sure. Well, you know, if you if you reflect on alcohol and what happened, although it's considered a, uh, uh, you know, if you become uh, addicted to alcohol, it's bad for your health. You die from it. Exactly. It can kill you. Yeah. You know. You can get killed behind the wheel of a car, or you can yeah. get killed walking on the street if you're if you're uh, intoxicated, you know, and and things of that nature. But it's not um, the manufacture of it is something else. Yeah. Okay. Here you have the full opportunity from A to B to manufacture it, to grow it, and then after that to produce produce whatever uh, you need, to, whatever you want to produce from it. And unless that's monitored, unless there's safety, uh, coordinated safety regulations, whatever else, you don't know what your product is. That's why in other communities where they're, they're doing the problem, they are. They have the problem. They're starting to second guess now. What are they selling? You yeah. Know? And I think a lot of it was laced with opioids, which seems to be hitting the news a lot. That's our biggest fir- yeah. Uh, fear. Yeah. It's mine anyway. Yeah. 
what are you buying? You know, yeah. What's, I don't use the product, you know, and I don't want to use it unless it becomes a necessity for health reasons, you know. So um, we uh, and, and so we have to ensure that if we're going to have something here, it's going to be safe, as safe as it possibly can get. Okay. Anything else, Joe? Um, that you want to mention? Not the- necessarily no? at this point. No. Okay. So thank you for joining us. We'll be uh, right back, and we'll be back with uh, Chief uh, Frank McCumber. Oh, maybe just one thing. Sorry. That's okay. Go ahead. Nominations tomorrow. Please get your names in there, as many as people as possible, and then go out and vote. Okay. Thank you so much. Yep. Uh, We'll be right back. Oh, no. Come on, (laughs) Elton. Welcome back to Deda Watarda, Party Line Talk Show. I'm your host, Lance Stacy, and joining me for the second part of today's MCK Friday is Chief Frank McCumber. Welcome to the show, Frank. How's it going? Thank you. Your team lost last night. I have to get that off. I, I have to get that off my chest, and uh, I just had to check because I didn't see anything on social media from some of my dear friends. So I would just. I, I went to bed really early. Oh, I did you? So you didn't see, see then? No. Oh, darn. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to pick on you, but. Did your Rangers win or something? Yes, they did. Okay, I, yes, I, yes. I'm glad you asked me. All right, let's get that over I with. Knew, I knew something was coming. <laughs> you knew something was coming. Um, I guess we're going to talk a little bit about the um, hunting. Uh, I wanted to ask about that because I know um, that was uh, the press release went out and there's a lot happening right now uh, with regards to hunting and a lot of different territories. Well, yeah, as you're aware, I'm a I'm a serious hunter. I, and that's why I'm asking you. <laughs> my, my, my family has been hunting since I can remember. Um, yeah, so I was I met with Chief uh, Darcy Gray in Quebec City in, in uh, late August to start discussing how we can set up a protocol. Um, two weeks later, uh, I met with him in Listegush to actually set up the protocol and to put it in place. Um, it's only uh, it's only in term until we can uh, figure that or one out. I'm, I'm actually going back next week to meet with him again to try to to make it a longer process or a permanent process. So right now, how how the process works is that you contact MCK at uh, hunting at mck.ca. We send your names, uh, the part, your, the, the time you're arriving and when you're departing. And uh, we do a follow-up to see if you had, had uh, shot a moose or not, and we send that information back to them uh, you know, as, they're, as they're asking. And it, was there something on limits, like in terms of uh, some of the animals that are hunted? or In the, letter, uh, in the response letter to us, it, it says that they, don't, they only want us to hunt uh, bull moose. Oh, okay. And their limit to is one moose per person. Ah, okay. As a hunter, does that make sense? It's it's an argumental point. Yes. But I mean, for an interim measure, I, I, I felt it was just important to make sure that we uh, we get something in place because we have many hunters that go. Actually, many more than I thought went are going. Even some people who I didn't know are going. So it's it's important that uh, this was put in place. The issue of hunting has been kind of a problem for quite a long time because many of the people from this community do go to hunt on other territories. That is correct. We... <laughs> Uh, again, before I got elected, it was under my opinion that we can. <laughs> Winona is going to be really upset. We, we were able to go on any crown land and hunt moose anytime we wanted, and and that was my uh, you know growing up. That's what I was taught, and so I followed that my entire life. Uh, being elected, it changes a few things. You want to create uh, friendships with communities, and that's what I've been working on. Okay. Um, in, in terms of some of those things, does it, what's going to happen with once this protocol is done or the time? Is there going to be other types of relationships with a variety of communities or, you know, what's going to happen with regards to hunting? You know, I, it seems to be a concern across. It's not just First Nations community. So. No, I agree with you. And I, I think it, it's, it's something that we have to start building relationships with uh, other Native communities. And uh, this is only to start. Okay. What are, um, anything else on the hunting? Uh, 
if you can get me the information a little earlier than last minute. So if you're leaving today and you send me the information today, it's going to be hard, you know, for it to get processed properly and uh, for the Rangers in Listagush to know about it. And just so everybody knows, uh, two weeks ago I was there and my son had shot a moose and we did get pulled over by the Rangers. And what happened? Well, they escorted us down the mountain. Um, you know, we did shoot a moose earlier that day. We were able to go back and get it the next day. And they just explained to us that they wanted to set a protocol in place. And, and that's what I was there for. The protocol was in place, but uh, the, the information didn't get across fast enough. Oh, okay. Is there a timeline? I have one more question. I knew I wasn't going to be done. Uh, is, is there a timeline for the hunting season? Uh, in, in theory well, or in, not in, in theory? Well, I mean... Because as, I know some people... As soon as fall comes, September something, there's people out hunting, yet I know there's other people who wait until later in the fall or, you know. Some people find it easier when the leaves are gone, like in, in November. Yes, and yes. I mean, what happens in Listagush is it's such a big area, right? It's such a vast area. So there's there's areas where uh, the white people are, is that proper word? Are permitted to hunt. Yeah. <laughs> Actually get permits to hunt. Yeah. So it, when they're hunting, it's really tough to go in that part of season because they, when they go hunting, it is very unsafe. Okay. In that area, so it's I I would advise to go against that. Don't go hunting during their hunting season. Go either before or after. Okay. Um, one more question on this. Uh, in, in terms of hunting, does it just apply to moose? What happens with deers and other? Because I know people in the community hunt. A variety of wild game. I, deer has not been discussed. No, I think, it's just there's so many. Moose, eh? Well, there's so many deer available, right? They're like, I mean, they're in our backyards. They're like rabbits. <laughs> I never <laughs> in thought my of opinion. it. I never thought of it that and way. And I don't eat deer, so yeah. I don't shoot them. Yeah, because I know of some people who do, actually quite more than what I had thought. But I, I mean, I'm, I'm willing to look into that if someone requests it. But again, deer, there's so many everywhere that... Uh, hmm. Okay. Uh, one more question on your protocol. Uh, in terms of people notifying you, 24 hours, 48 hours, what's ideal? Well, ideal would be as long as possible. A week before? A week before would be nice, but I mean, at least 24 hours, at least we can send the paperwork out. And at least, uh, you know, not Friday afternoon or Friday morning, preferably at least Thursday. Okay. If they're going to plan on going for the weekend, which is tough. Okay. Any other Issues on the topic of hunting? No, I think I think we covered it. But I, maybe I can tell the community that I am working on uh, helping List of Gush also with their lobster fishing, especially ah. for the last two weeks. So we're going to set up a protocol for hopefully spring fishing and then next year's lobster fishing, so we can help them and, and be able to sell their lobsters. Oh, so again, that'll be something a little bit different. Yeah, economic development wise, and kind of building a relationship through there. Okay. That's pretty cool. I, I never thought of lobsters as an issue, but I think as, as climate change is happening, I think we're going to have these kinds of problems um, with regards to food and wild game and fishing, et cetera, et cetera, because now everybody under the sun is uh, going to be doing it. And uh, I think it's going to get tougher and tougher for things that were basically our things as a tradition, just saying. Now that you brought that up, also we're, we're planning on doing a cultural exchange with Listagush in September of next year or late August when it has to be a cold week. And obviously we could bring a bunch of uh, youth to go up. And I know we had some mothers who, uh, who are single parents who want to take their children and teach them how to hunt. So we're going to try to set up a protocol, maybe start in, I don't know, maybe July and then teach them how to shoot a bow or shoot a gun and then go up north and then teach them, go to Listagush sorry, and teach them how to clean a moose and gut it and take care of it and pull it up properly. Oh, wow. That would be interesting. I bet you'd be a lot of young people that would be interested in that. It, it's a lost... I think it's something we're losing a lot. Even in Listagush, it's, it's it's lost. Not many people go hunting for moose anymore. So No, I did not know that. That's interesting. Let's take a break and we'll be right back. Welcome back to Deda Watarda, Party Line Talk Show. I'm your host, Lance Stacy, and we're joined by Chief um, Frank McCumber. And uh, I have a question for you. With the upcoming uh, by-election that's happening on Saturday, um, you you participated in 
the last by-election, you won the seat. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your experience and what it was like and why you ran to begin with and what the reality is of, of going into uh, into the council ring, I guess we could say. Well, I ran to try to get in, uh, get inside the, the council so they can try to understand economic development from a business idea. Um, I, I think it's it's tough to understand business if you have not been in it, you know, all your life, and if you've been involved in, in politics or, or whatever at MCK. But that being said, I mean, I got elected in February. Uh, I think it was almost six weeks I went by before uh, I really can get my bearings because almost everybody was on vacation. You know, so you get elected on a Saturday, on Monday, you're at the table uh, making a decision. Uh, I am not sure if that's how it works in a big election, but in a by-election, it was really stressful for me as getting in there and going, I got to make a decision today. So no there background. was no orientation, no background, no nothing. You just walked in and you were at the council table. Correct. I walked in, they said, that's your office. It was just a pile of junk on a desk. And I was like, okay. <laughs> So, yeah, that's basically how it started. So, with the new people who are thinking about running, what, what are, like, some thoughts or some some suggestions that you talk to people? Because I think one of the things that comes out, and I hear this a lot as the talk show ho- hosts or have seen things, you know, that people don't know what really goes on at the council office the same way people have commented that people at the council office aren't that clued into some of the happenings in the community, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we seem to have a gap, but what would be your recommendation, you know, for people who are considering they still have a few hours before, t- uh, before tomorrow morning. So I just, you know, I just thought it'd be worthwhile to just hear what your experience has been. I think the by-election is a good and bad thing. I mean, on the good part, you get to jump in immediately. On the bad part, you don't get to go through the whole process as a, as a team with the rest of the council. I think in learning everything, I for me again, I was alone for a while, like six weeks before you can start catching up with everybody. And I don't think we had a meeting with all the chiefs for probably two months before everybody was actually in a meeting with 12, uh, 12 chiefs. So the process is is tough. You have to read a lot and learn a lot. And I would I would say that you should do get as much information as possible and read up on, on how, how our Ganawage works. And to understand how actually big that wheel is and all the people that takes to, you know, to push it, even though I know it goes slow, but th- what it takes to get it going and the mechanics of it all is just, that part's incredible. I actually said on many occasions that I wish I had a camera on my head so the community could see what I see at this point, right? Now, uh, how important it all is so that everything works when it comes to buses and transportation and fixing the roads and water. There's so much stuff that goes in. It's involved in it. It's not just one thing. It's everything. Um, What about the new process in terms of um, the chiefs being on different portfolios and kind of a team setting, which I knew, which I know was something that was pretty new? That's actually the only process I know. Uh, since I got in, that process has been practiced, so I, I didn't know what the practice was before. Uh, I have a question for you on the hunting uh, situation. A man who is Inuit status doesn't live uh, doesn't live in K Town. Can they apply for MCK for paperwork uh, for hunting, or does it is it just specifically does the protocol just specifically apply to uh, Ganawagerono? Specifically right now, yes, it does. Okay. Uh, because the list of Gush is asking for a band number. Uh, that it only came in after the fact, so that we send the band numbers. So, yeah, I, I think it just relates to Gun and Walk. I don't know. Okay, perfect. So now let's get back to this uh, this jump. Um, what has been your learning? Like, what have been some of your biggest learnings coming into being a council chief and partway through a term? Well, an extremely slow process. Right. To get something from point A to point B, is, is it takes long. Um, Jeez, I'm stumped a little bit. Oh. <laughs> I mean, ask a different question. Let, let's get a different question. Yeah. Um, what, um, go, looking back, um, did you feel you were prepared uh, to jump into this? Or could you have done other things? I wasn't prepared, but I think I was mentally ready for it. You know, and uh, you have to go in... Uh, knowing that you can't be prejudged 
on anybody. You have to go in and, and you can have no judgment towards anybody, whether they're at the table or in the whole institution. I think that's the key point. You got to go in. You got to work with these people every day. I think my idea was as before I got in, I had one business partner. When I got in, now I have eleven. Ah, uh, okay. Right. Even if you don't agree on something, you still got to be able to discuss it the next day or even later on. So uh, that's important to note. And uh, I, I guess on a, on another note, in in terms of uh, being there uh, as as a council person who comes in after you know midway through the term, what advice would you tell people? Like, uh, should they know topics? Should they be familiar with what's going on within the community? You know, I I know sometimes people think they know, but I'm not sure whether people really know. That's a really good I, I actually thought I knew a lot about what was going on in our community, and uh, I realized when I got in, I basically knew nothing. So uh, I think it's going to be a learning process. If you're if you're going to be a new uh, MCK mem- chief member, it's going to be a totally new process for you. I don't think you can prepare for it, actually. I remember listening to many of the candidates, and in this job we get to interview candidates, and, you know, some came in with the idea of making changes and that, and I I guess I'm familiar with um, um, organizations and change and systems, and knowing from systems without people, no matter where the organization is, it's the hardest thing to go into because there are things in place most community people don't know or most the average citizen doesn't know. Then when you get in there, you know, you're, you're thinking you're going to promise this, you're going to do that. Your hands are tied. Yeah, you got to follow the protocol and procedures. Yeah, I, I, I make a lot of mistakes in that area when it comes to whether it's uh, making sure the right people get the emails or stuff like that, forward it to the right people. I always either uh, don't send uh, an invite to someone and they miss it and, you know, I, getting used to that is, is, is a tough process. They also keep, they also, before I got in, I was also under the impression that we had a lot of administration help, you know, where they at least helped you with your, that's what I was used to anyway, yeah. as a businessman, right? You're used right. to people helping you with your emails and setting up meetings and this, I mean, we do have really great people, but there are limited with only, I think we only have two. So they really have to work their butt off and, 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 and you know, to take care of all 12 of us. It's a lot of work for 12 people. So that part of you know, I'm struggling with, I guess, also. Um, uh, so now that you've gone in, in terms of your your championing the part of the business owner, what would it, where's that at? <laughs> um, I, I think we have many discussions and maybe even sometimes arguments about uh, the different ideas when it comes to business. You know, I'm a believer that uh, government should not be in business. You know, if you want to partner up with a business, you want to invest in a business, I think that's fantastic. But to say MCK can get into business and actually run it, I don't, I don't quite agree with that. Unless it's a maybe a specific business when it comes to transporting material, uh, say lobsters from Listagush to Gunawage, like that. Maybe that's something to get into. But other than that, I don't, I can't see it. Like to be able to sell something. Okay. Um, so, um, in in terms of your. Um how do you use your sense of business and experience as business within this sector? Because we're talking different sectors. It's really tough because I'm used to moving so quickly. You know, getting things quickly or meeting quickly. Like if we want to move something in, in the private business, you can set up a meeting in two days if it's important to everybody. This, it's almost impossible to set up a meeting in two days. You got to either a week, a month. It all depends on, on who's involved. And that's that's the bigger problem, I guess. Wow. You got involved directors. You got involved other portfolio chiefs. You got—it's just text. It's plus work sometimes with different organizations, right? Right. Like it's not just MCK. It could be Cater Memorial Hospital. It could be KSCS. It could be education system. Like it's not just one system. That's correct. Hmm. Yeah. I guess that was a big learning for you. It still is a learning curve for me. I'm not there yet. I'm making many <laughs> mistakes. But you learn from your mistakes, and that's, that, right. that's what it's about, you know. Um, anything else on this or advice that you could give to anyone who's considering running in the upcoming by-election? No, just, you know what, take a chance and, and come in with a good heart. And, uh, you know, we're, we are actually there to help you also, so uh, we're, we work as a, as a team most of the time. So it's uh, it's fun, and it's tough at the same time. 
<laughs> words of wisdom from <laughs> Frank McCumber. No, just kidding. Um, in terms of some other topics, um, what is uh, happening with the regulation of tobacco and to the, the tobacco law? Because we haven't heard very much on that topic. We actually met with the KTA and Peggy Mayo a week and a half ago uh, to discuss about if we're, if the law is going to be, I guess, put to bed, or if they're going to, or we're going to revive it. Uh, the KTA is interested in reviving it. I actually don't think that's the word they used. They actually felt that it was left in MCK's hands. So there's a few areas of uh, discussion that have to take place, and uh, I'm working on that right now with uh, Chief Tanya Perron. She's helping me to get through the legal parts of it, and, and, and uh, it, it's a process. I have a question for a listener. It's it's a little comical, but he wants okay. to know how many times a day does the stash swi- uh, wipe out of frustration? Like, do do you get frustrated as you know in in terms of your day to day kind of stuff? It all depends on the day and the discussion. Okay. I guess. Yeah, that's that's the part. Of what are some of the portfolios that you're responsible for? Uh, public safety. I'm the lead on public safety. I'm a part of economic development. Um, what about uh, what, what is happening in that economic development? We I just actually attended my first economic development meeting on Wednesday. I've been uh, I haven't been able to get in all the meetings because I'm I'm booked in advance. So uh, we we met to discuss the new uh, business development fund. Yes, you know the thirty million dollars from yeah. Boista that that fund and, and working on trying to find out how we're going to invest that in uh, in our community and businesses. Oh, okay. It's really all I know at this time. <laughs> You're still getting your feet yeah, wet, I'm aren't still you? Yeah, getting my feet wet. I don't want to <laughs> say something I, I can't say. So, <laughs> I guess it's part of the learning curve, right? Maybe that's the part I, I would like to talk about is, is, is when you get elected, it's not knowing where those lines are about what you can talk about and what you can't talk about because it's not very clear. Even at the table, I, I've asked that question, you know, where is the line? It's like, what can I talk about? What can you not talk yeah. about? It's very unclear, and it, it kind of you feel siloed out at one point from the rest of your community, family, whatever, because you don't know uh, if you can uh, discuss certain issues, right? right? So what are some other um, portfolios? Oh, what else did I say I was on? The tobacco one? Yeah. Uh, public safety. I'm on the police board. That's uh, very different from me. Uh, it's something uh, that I learned a lot about, you know, uh, how tough it is to be a, a PK in our community, where you have to deal with not only with the people, but with the government and, you know, with the outside and, and the, the 100,000 people that come to our community every day. And, you know, I, I guess my head was in a, either in a tunnel or stuck in the ground for a while, and I didn't get to see what was going on. And so learning everything is really... Uh, was I open to me? I, I think a lot of the issues it makes it sound so easy when you say policing or you say health and you say safety, you say you know, it sounds simple. Right. What's your experience? It's not that simple, is it? Oh, they have one hell of a job and uh I give the credit to them all. You know, it's gotta be a, a tough position to be in. Not only do you have to deal with your friends on a daily basis, but you know, your family and stuff like that, but it, you have to make tough decisions at at a spare the moment time, so it's gotta be a my hats are off to all the PKs for that. That's not an easy job, No, it's job, not a fun job, it? and it's really tough. Even to hear the stories and uh, the information that I get, it's just, it's crazy. And I, and I guess sometimes that's the part that could be overwhelming because you're trying to work in, in the environment of creating change and doing some things, but the reality of what's happening outside, sometimes they don't match. That's correct. And a lot of reality is happening in our community that a lot of people don't know about. And I think sometimes that's the overwhelming part is because you can't handle everything. Yeah, and and the other part is that you there's not many people you can talk to about it, right? You can only, you have maybe 12 people you can talk to about it and that's it. That's, that's the other tough part of it, about it. Let's talk, we have a few more minutes. Uh, any other portfolios? Oh, you're making me think now. I'm gonna make any work for this half hour. No, <laughs> no kidding. Um, I can't remember. I'm well, sure there is. I'm, I'm sure you are, but I, I don't even remember. <laughs> uh, but maybe we can talk about this notice that, uh, for the World Trade Center first responders. I was asked by Lindsay to maybe talk Plug about it, it a little okay. bit. Yeah. 
because uh, I guess the Mohawk Council wants to wish the community the members that participated in the cleanup of the World Trade Center. Sorry, I don't have my glasses. Or do I? No. Uh, the aftermath in 9-11 attacks that uh, World Trade Center Health Program and 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund has been established to compensate claimants diagnosed with certified WTC illnesses. Uh, it's a... Uh, According to www.911victimfund.com, if you responded to the World Trade Center site or the, or the landfill and were exposed to toxins, you were entitled to free health care and compensation for 9-11 related illnesses. The Victim Compensation Fund has been permanently extended and fully funded. Information packages have been made available at the Ganawagi Labor Office. I, I just think it's important that the community knows that. We have a lot of guys that actually did that. I learned that more, actually, when I got on council, about how many guys actually did there that. There was a lot. There, there was, was a, lot, a lot. Including Lindsay LeBourne. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of, well, my family was there, so I know many of them had uh, had helped out. And uh, what, what's uh, interesting is is that a lot of the illnesses only came out later. Like, it wasn't instant, wasn't right away, you know, and people got sick later on. And, you know, some people didn't make it, you know, and then there's those who are who are now severely ill. Yeah, it's a, it was a hell of a thing. So you have uh, about two seconds to, to final words and uh, of wisdom and uh, anything else you want to say? Final words. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, awesome. And if people have any questions regarding the hunting, what's the best way to get a hold of you? You can call me at MCK anytime. I'm actually available to the community at any time since I work for them. Uh, you know, my, my doors are always open and my phones are always open for any community member to call. Thank you so much, uh, Chief Frank McCumber. Uh, coming up on Monday, we'll have um, Jasmine Gautier from FNRAEC, and we're going to talk about uh, a clothing market that's happening at the school on um, October the 10th. And we'll also have uh, representatives from the Family and Wellness Center, uh, Trudy Jacobs and Frankie Mazzucati. And we're going to try to get the community to put some input in the upcoming uh, family photo contest that's happening for the month of November for Spirit of Wellness. And uh, should be an interesting thing. If the community would like to get involved, you can give us a call on Monday, 450-638-1313. Up next with the 1 o'clock news is Jim Connell. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Onigiwahi.